Now we will begin the part two of GOI Peace Foundation Forum 2023 dialogue session. On the panel, we have GOI Peace Award laureate Dr. Sila Elworthy and as panelists, Dr. Hiroshi Tasaka, Mr. Masaya Onimaru, uh, who will be joined by Chairperson Masami Sayonji. The theme of the panel discussion is training or dialogue session is turning aspiration into action. The session will be facilitated by President Hiro O. Sayonji. Please welcome the members of the panel with a round of applause. Now, uh, President Sayonji, over to you, please. Thank you. We would like to begin part two, dialogue session. The uh, theme of the uh, dialogue session is changing the world from within, uh, rather, turning aspiration into action. The panelists have a very high aspiration, including Dr. Zilla Elworthy, and uh, all the speakers have strived to make uh, the world a better uh, place. With the uh, four panelists, uh, we would like to have dialogue session. Let me introduce the uh, members of the panel. We have uh, the laureate of Goy Peace Award, Dr. Sila Elworthy. She will be joining the dialogue session as well. Thank you very much. And next to Dr. Elworthy is Dr. Hiroshi Tasaka. He is the president of 21st Century Academia, and he is an honorary professor, Professor Emeritus of Tama, Tama University. He is. Uh, he has many talents. He is a man of many talents. He has written. A 100 books, and uh, he is uh, developing social entrepreneurs. He's uh, educating uh, business persons. At the time of the uh, March 11, 2011 earthquake, he was the advisor to the cabinet uh, to uh, respond to nuclear disaster and uh, for countermeasures. He uh, obtained a PhD from the University of Tokyo in nuclear engineering. He is a scientist by background, but he's uh, very active in many different fields. If I introduce uh, Dr. Tasaka fully, it is going to be quite a uh, uh, time. Uh, it will, I will have to spend much time. I respect him very deeply, and I believe in the past of forum, uh, when we had uh, Dr. Jack Atali, I, and uh, the session was uh, held uh, virtually, and uh, Dr. Tazaka joined on that occasion. And I believe uh, on two past other occasions during the forum, we had invited uh, Dr. Tazaka. He is the president of 21st Century Academia. In April this year, he became the president. And Around 5,000 uh, per class uh, students are learning, and uh, there are 17 locations uh, at the Academia 21st Century. He's the chancellor of Academia 21st Century. And thank you very much uh, for joining us despite your very busy schedule. And to the uh, right uh, of Dr. Tasaka is Mr. Masaya Onimaru, who is the um, founder of Terra Renaissance. And when he was a student, 
he knew of the um, problems of the landmines and minefield. And uh, while he was still a university student, he founded Terra Renaissance, an NGO. And he has uh, visited uh, Cambodia and Laos uh, to support uh, a minefield clearance and also in Uganda and Congo. There are child soldiers. This is a, such a tragic story, and he's supporting the former child soldiers. He is engaged at, uh, mainly in the field work, actually in the field. As for our foundation, I've uh, talked about the uh, 21st uh, lecture series. Uh, lecture series. He has uh, joined that lecture series, a value for the values for the 21st century, and uh, there is also a career program, our campus, for junior and senior high school students, and he has kindly given a lecture. And uh, we uh, treasure uh, close relations with uh, Mr. Onimaru, and thank you very much for joining today. And uh, Chair uh, Masami Sayonji will be joining the panelists, and I will be uh, serving as coordinator for this dialogue. As I listened to the uh, lecture by uh, Dr. Elworthy, I learned that uh, since uh, when she was very young, she had very strong feelings about the peace and she wanted to eliminate war in some way, and she has dedicated uh, her life uh, to these efforts. And as I listened, I was astounded that uh, you were, as young as when you were 13, uh, that uh, you were motivated to help after watching the uh, scenes of Soviet tanks uh, killing teenagers in hung Hungary. You've packed a suitcase. You said you have to go to Hungary. And the decisiveness, the determination, a 13-year-old girl to show such a strong determination uh, is quite surprising and left me a very deep impression. Now that we've heard uh, the commemorative uh, lecture by Dr. Elworthy, I would also like to invite two other panelists uh, for comments. Uh, they also have very high aspirations and have a strong sense of mission. Why did you come to have such a strong sense of mission? And how did you uh, realize uh, your, how do you realize your mission as a way of self-introduction? And uh, could you also um, share uh, your impression uh, after listening to the lecture by Dr. Elworthy? Perhaps we can go uh, younger first, uh, starting with Mr. Onimaru. Thank you very much. The sense of mission, you've asked about us, how I came to have a sense of mission. When did I first um, come to have a sense of mission? When I search uh, within myself, uh, first uh, it was uh, when I was senior in high school student. I was a 12th grader. I visited uh, Sri Lanka and uh, there is a Salpodaya Shuranada movement, NGO movement, and this movement was founded by Ari Adadone, and I uh, was able to meet him, and he told me, do you want to change the world? I uh, said yes, and oh, I see, I will teach you how to change the world, and I asked, how to change the world, it doesn't require special knowledge, special experience, or special asset. But just remember this word, is what I was told. Everyone has a power to make the future uh, with abilities or disabilities, uh, men or women, uh, irrespective of income. Everyone has the ability to make future. We have inherent power to make future. Everything changes. I think uh, he was also teaching the Buddhist uh, teaching of uh, everything is not constant. And uh, that uh, left a strong impression on me. And as I went to university, uh, in the senior year of university, I went to Cambodia and I went 
to the minefield where mine clearance activities were ongoing, but I learned that it takes time to demine and uh, how uh, horrible the lives of uh, the people who were the victims of uh, minefield were. But I was a mere university student. I did not have skill to clear the mines, and I'm from a poor family. I did not have my, I did not have a, have money to donate, and unfortunately, and even still today, I was not fluent in English. I see that there is something I wanted to do about. I want to do something about. But uh, all I found was uh, that I was not able to do anything. But I remember the word told in Sri Lanka by Ari Adonesan. And I felt that uh, looking back on myself, I am able to communicate to other people. In Japan, uh, using Japanese language, I can tell about the uh, minefield situation in Cambodia. So I uh, gave a lecture. I made a, a various uh, failures, and I gave uh, 90 lectures in that year. And this is the 24th year after I started this activity. And uh, everywhere in Japan, I spoke to about 240,000 people in total. Yesterday, I just uh, spoke to people in Chiba Prefecture. And some uh, people are also interested in working uh, with us. And uh, we are able to engage in activity as a terror renaissance. And we are now active in Cambodia. Cambodia, uh, Laos, uh, Congo, Burundi, and Ukraine as well. In these uh, conflict areas, people are living in sorrow, and we are supporting them uh, with uh, jobs training and uh, literacy training, so they are able to lead their lives. Uh, this is unusual as a Japanese NGO, but we are combining various uh, support uh, activities. As I listen to Dr. Elworthy's speech, this is what really left in my heart. Uh, when you were 13, you saw the Hungary, that situation, and then you immediately you thought about what you could do. I mean, almost instantaneously, I think you asked yourself, what can I do? And without any hesitation, you wanted to take action. So from that particular question, to actually start taking action. It was so instantaneous. And there was some invisible force. It might be God, it might be heaven, it might be something. But when a person takes action, that kind of invisible, big something is talking to your heart. And when you're seriously listening to the voice, then big courage is born. And that's once again what I felt listening to you. Thank you. Dr. Tasaka, the, uh, again, the similar question to you. Let's see. About Dr. Elwood, this the speech, if I was to start talking about it, I would need one hour. That was really impressive. But to be honest with you, in your speech, this really struck cause in me, the very first episode. You are not the 13-year-old that episode, but your brother, George, I think 10 years older, but you lost your brother. And it was really, really a horrible experience. It was painful, and that you were heartbroken. But that didn't actually end as just being heartbroken. I mean, that's what's excellent about people in your life. And I don't want to be presumptuous to outlay my own per life, but about this ambition, aspiration, and come to think when I learned to have this aspiration, I lost one family member, and that supports who I am today. Not my, in my case, brother, it, I lost my mother. She was 65 years old, so she was not that young when she passed away. But she had a very difficult time. I just wanted to be a filial son, and I wanted to be a good son, and then I couldn't do that, and I just had to see her go. And I'm pretty sure you have lost your family members, those of you who are sitting in the audience, for the very first time in my own life. And there's, I just had 
a horrible cry, gut-wrenching cry from the bottom of my soul that I just had this real cry, horrible cry, gut-wrenching, this wailing. And that I actually is leading the way I live now. If I were to find any aspiration in me, it's not something that's grand. The life that my mother had, I want it to be meaningful, her life to be meaningful. So this is what I want to tell you. The significance of one person's life says when she or he has left this world, you would find out that person. There, there are always people who lovingly nurture these people per person. So the significance of one person's life can be found can be found when you close the coffin of the loved ones that she or he cared for. So that means that her, the meaning of her life will be found when my coffin is closed. So as little as I am, the small as I am, I just would like to pay my contribution. And if you ask me to talk about aspiration, that's all I can say, Not, nothing grand, but one could live one's life in this way, small way. Dr. Elworthy, I believe that you are with you, living your life with your brother. Somehow, I just believe it. So that family member, we can be a friend, someone who's really, really close to you, that you just simply feel so grateful that you have encountered, you have known that person. And if you have such encounters, even if those people leave, they, if, even if they pass away, they will keep guiding our lives. So this is what I wanted to share with you as my impression of your speech, Dr. Elwadi. Thank you. So the chairperson the, about Dr. Elwadi's speech and the two panelists' impression, would you like to? Yes, you, you. Turn on the microphone, chairperson. Those were just the impressive speeches. Right. I really felt it in my heart. And Dr. Worthy's speech and uh, about this touching your souls, touching of souls. Yes, I felt this, that you have encountered some great persons and that can be a turning point in your own life. But those people that you meet, it's not coincidence. It's inevitable. You need the people and then you want to meet them. And in your own heart, unless there is a kind of aim, it's you don't meet, encounter these people. It's not coincidence. It's not accidental. Of course, you could live your lives in many ways, but the three of you, you are all spiritual for others. You live for others. You just think what you can do for others. You don't really have your ego. You just want to serve others, how to do a better life. You have those theme between you and others normally. You want to get a good job, you want to get a good position, you want to get a nice girlfriend, and you are egocentric, and then you select things, you choose to do certain things and make decisions. But those of you who want to be of service to others, then you would think what you can do for others. I mean, if you can't speak English, you don't have the academic great background, but you always want to help others, even just a small thing, just saying good morning, or, or when you see someone who's just waiting on the street, you would just ask that person, are you all right, how are you? And that little thing does matter. 
So sometimes you just don't just, just ignore such people, to the stranger. Japanese people tend to find it rather difficult to, to talk to strangers. We don't have those customers, so you don't speak to strangers. But in my case, when I see someone, total stranger, I will talk to them. And then they are happy. They would, they would say, no, no, I'm OK, but thank you so much for talking to me. They would say it's like that. I mean, it doesn't have to be excellent, great things, overwhelming, grand things, but in your small things in your day-to-day life, there are those sad people who are suffering. You just just talk to them. It's not really about donation. You just ask them, how are you? That, those things, I think those are actions are necessary, in my opinion. I know. Right. That's so right. Sometimes uh, the person is talking to, uh, I thought that she was talking to someone and she was speaking to a flower or flowers. Dr. Elworthy, when you were 30 years old, it, we didn't hear this in your speech, but uh, you, had, you had given birth to your baby daughter and uh, you had brain disease, the, uh, serious encephalitis, and then the doctor said one, you lost one third of your brain cells. And every day you had a horrible headache for six years. Every day you had a horrible headache. So during that time, so there was a one question that you had in your mind, who am I? Why am I here? Who am I? Why am I here? You kept asking the question. I read that. So for Dr. Elworthy, that time, in terms of finding yourself, looking at yourself, I think it was a real important time for introspection. So the world within, the power within, you are awakened to that. And that as you engaged in uh, various uh, dispute uh, resolution uh, activities, uh, that experience, uh, you were able to bring to bear that experience. And uh, inner force, inner strength, what kind of force power is it? What kind of um, power is inner power? Could you elaborate on that? Or how can people exert inner power. Thank you so much for these questions, very close to my heart. And um, I do uh, pick up what you said, because the um, experience of um, severe pain for many years uh, also um, enables deeper questions to be asked inside. And my question, as you said, was, who am I? What, what am I doing here? What am I here for? And I can see, just looking out at our audience today, that many people are asking themselves that question, or have asked it. So it's a very human question. Why am I really here? And the next question is, how can I serve? Um, so I believe that what we can invite is beyond the intellect. It is the spirit that wants to be uh, recognized in this world and used in this world to enable human beings to be more wise and less stupid. Because many of us today are doing stupid things. And it is necessary that uh, spirit, uh, good sense, uh, kindness, and calmness that you described, that can stop uh, violence. So um, 
I would say, um, if I may show a diagram of violence, it's um, diagram number one. It's the cycle of violence. Uh, if you can see it. There we go. Thank you for making this slide. Because if we begin at the top, when there is an atrocity, in other words, some explosion of violence, the first thing that happens to the left is shock. The second thing that happens is fear. The third thing that happens when we um, get deeper into the fear is grief. Grief for all who have been killed. And then, if nothing is done, that grief turns into anger, as we are seeing in the Middle East. And if nothing is done about that anger, it becomes bitterness. Bitterness turns into revenge. And revenge turns into retaliation. And then there is another explosion of violence, another atrocity. So our job, whether it's in our children's school or in our streets, if we are confronted by violence, the first thing we can do is breathe. And it's the hardest thing to do because we are afraid, we're shocked. But if we can be present enough to breathe deeply when we are frightened, we can be more useful. Because when we are present, we can see what the other people, the people who are perhaps angry or bitter or violent, we can see more clearly what they need. And maybe by asking very calmly and quietly, tell me what you need. That is a way to break that cycle of violence and to really listen. As I said earlier, to listen to what the feelings are underneath. Now, we cannot promise that that will stop a knife fight in the street, but it will bring the temperature down so there is not so much fury in the environment. And the same is true in the, when wars start. If at the very beginning of armed violence, people can be there who are calm inside. This will help to prevent what we call escalation. I don't know if this answers your question. Thank you very much. And Mr. Onimaru, you are supporting uh, landmine clearance activities and uh, supporting former child soldiers. I'm sure you have encountered uh, various difficulties and uh, perhaps uh, dangerous situations. In those occasions, on those occasions, as uh, Dr. Elworthy mentioned, with um, external force, uh, nothing can be done. But have you experienced where your inner strength or inner power was useful? Thank you for that question. We try to ensure safety as much as possible in our activities, but not only myself, but there are Japanese staff and local staff uh, working in nine countries uh, locally, and sometimes they encounter danger and difficulty. Ultimately, the only thing we can do is to pray. And human beings are given the skill of prayer, and I'm very thankful that uh, we are given uh, this uh, means of praying. There is an ultimate uh, situation where we can only pray, but when we pray, then uh, in the form of human beings, 
in many uh, occasions, the help emerges. For example, in Eastern Congo, we are uh, doing activities, and as uh, people say, it is a stealth war. No one takes uh, a, a recognition of uh, the ongoing uh, stealth uh, war. And our Japanese staff are sometimes targeted by the militias. And our Congo, uh, Congolese uh, staff chief uh, uh, was almost abducted by a militia, but it was an attempted uh, abduction. And uh, we were supported by former child soldiers that we supported. The former child soldier went to persuade to free our staff. And uh, they, uh, the child soldier persuaded that it will be a loss on both sides. So something called miracle is brought by human beings. And uh, I have experienced the same in other countries. So ultimately, uh, we have to place trust in others. And at Terra Renaissance, at our organization, we have emphasized the importance of placing trust in others. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Tasaka, you've mentioned that uh, for you, what was um, uh, important uh, tr um, turning point was the loss of your mother, but you also had a very serious uh, illness. Uh, it was a life or death uh, situation. And after that very serious uh, illness uh, experience, I think you strengthened uh, your sense of uh, mission was strengthened, as I understand. Aside from words, I think uh, even in small ways, people encounter desperate situations or uh, extremely difficult situations. And when we encounter these um, difficulties, and as Mr. Onimaru said, there is some invisible force that emerges, and I'm sure quite a few people have such experience. Dr. Tasaka, what is your take on that? Yes, you have asked a very important question. And to answer your question, what I wanted to convey earlier is that I think you have experienced the loss of very important people in your life, be it your relatives or family members, and that is a heartbreaking experience. But Dr. Elworthy said that a heartbreaking experience uh, has changed her life, and I was deeply impressed uh, by that and uh, had a strong a sense of uh, uh, empathy. We, it's beyond words how difficult it is to lose someone who is important in your life, but even uh, in afterlife, they continue to guide us um, for over several decades. I feel that my mother is guiding me in various uh, different uh, situations. That is not an illusion. I feel that uh, very uh, clearly, and I'm sure many members of the audience have experienced that. The science today said that that is an illusion. I'd like to come back to this later, but when you had this life or death type of experience, that question, who am I? You are weakened to that. I don't know whether this is applicable to all of us, but first, when the doctor says, as 40 years ago, that I didn't have much time left, I was at the bottom of everything. I felt that I was in the woods, and I just kept wondering and wondering because I was in despair. I read so many kinds of religious books, books on religions. It's not really supporting me or anything, but uh, G.D. Krishnamurti, Indian writer, his words saved me. You are the world. The world is you. That saved me. When you are in an extreme situation, you are the world, the world is you. Of course, I'm really at the gate of the entrance, entrance of the gate, but I, my eyes opened. And one, one more thing, inner power, power within. To paraphrase it in my own words, uh, 
what is the strength of a person, the real strength? Because out of force, this is like winning a game or being successful in your own life, having accomplished something, those things. But about inner power, the real strength of a person. What is the real strength of a person or human being? With my conviction, within the ego in your heart, being able to see that, that's really the strength of a person. Dr. Elworthy, you showed us that cycle. Why do we become indignant and then just exert violence and then start high fighting a war? Because we can't acknowledge the ego within ourselves. I wouldn't say stop the ego, but how to cope with this ego? You don't know how to cope. That's why I'm still in the training. So looking at my ego in my own part, I'm still doing this. But in three years, five years, ten years' time, if I keep doing this, then inevitably your inner power, I think it will be refined, it will become strong. And if I may just add one more word, you will be encountering mysterious things that would guide you. Somehow you will attract fortune or luck. I wrote a book about this, but just to, just to what is for your reference about the inner force. Thank you. It's, I think, also related to inner power or inner force. Took Dale Worthy at the outset. In your commemorative speech, you talked about to solve conflicts, the women, this femininity, women, was really powerful in that regard in order to, for the betterment of the society, this women character and men characters are necessary. It's not really about equality between the two gender. I mean, even in man, you have this femininity and vice versa. So what's this the f femininity or female character? Of course, there are many interpretations. But to solve conflicts, it can be of service. It can be useful. Scientifically, it's known. I heard it somewhere that scientifically it's known. Would you like to elaborate on that? Scientifically, about this femininity or female characteristic is effective in solving conflicts. And there is a scientific evidence. Thank you for this um, very welcome question. Um, I find that um, w women tend to have had more experience of caring for other human beings because uh, when we, if we're lucky enough to give birth, we have a tiny infant totally dependent on us and our, our men folk and very vulnerable. So we, we develop this um, understanding of the pain or the need of another human being very early. And that's kind of inbuilt. And it can be just the same for a father, of course. But women tend, up to now, to have had the responsibility for caring for tiny beings who are helpless, apparently helpless. So that's one thing. The, the other is what I like to call <clears throat> right brain intelligence, um, particularly now in the age of AI. Everyone is um, gearing up for artificial intelligence. And some people are very scared, and they may be right. I don't know. But what I do know is that when, and I think that AI is very, I'm being a little crude now, but AI is typically left brain intelligence. Whereas if we bring in right brain intelligence, that consists mostly of um, sensitivity, compassion, communication, collaboration, listening, and feeling for the other. 
And I believe that um, we can, maybe the advent of AI, artificial intelligence, will encourage us to value what is the other part of our capacity, namely the uh, skills that I have mentioned, which are all part, I believe, of right brain intelligence, equally accessible to men as to women. It's not a gender thing. Uh, so there is what we might call feminine intelligence, but now I more and more feel it is right brain intelligence. Because that is what may, enables us to uh, break out of the purely mathematical computation of violence or war or aggression and to inhabit the, the heart that we've been talking about. And um, I, I love to teach that, if I may just explain how we teach it, it, it very quickly. If I could have the other slide. Um, this is how we teach the mighty heart intelligence. Because, um, as I've said, I've realized in my life how important uh, the heart is. So, we always start asking people, asking our students, what breaks your heart? Because as we've seen today, and thanks to your hosting of this meeting, there is a big energy in the heart break. So we enable our students to really feel that. And then in the next session, which might be the following week, we go into the question of really listening because we all think we're good listeners, but most of us really are not. I could tell you many stories about that. Then we teach nonviolent communication, which is known as NVC. And then we go to the inner critic. Now, if I ask an audience, how many of you do not have an inner critic? Please raise your hands. You see, there are none of us human beings who do not have an inner critic. But that inner critic can uh, disenable us, can wipe out our capacity like that because it is so uh, um, fierce, especially at two or three o'clock in the morning when it wakes us up and says, why did you do that? And, What's the matter with you that you didn't do that? You, you know about this, Maki. So we have to learn to have a dialogue with the inner critic and convert it, because it has a lot of energy in it. So what I do with mine, and you will think I'm completely mad, I, when it wakes me up at 3 o'clock in the morning, I go in the bathroom, put on the light, and put two cushions. I sit on one and I say to the inner critic, why did you wake me up at three o'clock in the morning? And then I put myself on the other cushion and I answer in its voice. And it says, well, of course I woke you up because you made such a mistake and you didn't uh, speak properly to those people and what's the matter with you? And then I go back to my cushion and I say, that's not very helpful. I need you to tell me what I need to know. Because my experience is that the inner critic has a lot of wisdom. But it likes to just be critical. But if we can really make it tell us, it can tell us life truths that can really guide us. So that's um, how we go through this work. Just coming down the side of this side, we then need to clean up our anger. Anger is a wonderful um, power, but if you spray it out on another person, you can do terrible damage. It's like um, making a, a, a fire if you uh, put your anger on someone else. But if you keep it inside yourself, it's a huge, uh, like a gasoline in your engine. 
It helps you to get up tomorrow and do more of what needs to be done. And so cleaning up our anger and making it like an energy is very, very useful. And then developing presence. Um, do I have time to tell one short story? Just a very short one. Well, it, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Hughes, an American Lieutenant Colonel, was leading his men down a street in Najaf just after the beginning of the Iraq war in 2003. All of a sudden, out of the streets came furiously angry Arab men shouting and screaming in Arabic. And these young soldiers, American soldiers, didn't understand and they were scared. And Chris Hughes said, he didn't say anything. He just put his weapon above his head and pointed it into the ground. And then he gave his, his men one instruction, kneel. They never had such an instruction in their lives. And they wobbled to the ground with their heavy backpacks and put their weapons facing the ground. And the whole crowd grew silent. The silence lasted for two minutes. And then everyone went home. Nobody was killed. So there's a big secret in there. So I could go on around the circle, but it's, Maybe we don't have time. Thank you. Thank you. That is a wonderful story. That is not uh, something that you can plan for. It's uh, happening all of a sudden. But inner force tells you this is the right thing to do. I think uh, I would imagine that that is the case. And uh, we've uh, discussed uh, women uh, gender. Uh, it can be an important way to change the society. And the chairperson, uh, SOW, uh, Soul of Women, is a group uh, that uh, she um, uh, leads. Together with uh, women, uh, they engage in discussions. And tomorrow, we have invited uh, Dr. Elworthy uh, to this meeting. And uh, the, uh, women gender um, has uh, various uh, good qualities. And uh, we would like uh, the society to be able to embrace and make good use of that. In 2010, our laureate, uh, Dr. Lynn Twist, talked about uh, indigenous people in the United States. People are like birds, but now human beings or the birds are using only the left wing in their flights, only with the male gender uh, qualities. It is out of balance. Uh, we have to have the right balance between men and women gender. I recall that uh, laureate's uh, lecture. So uh, we have to create a society where um, there is a better balance uh, between the qualities of both genders. Uh, chairperson? No matter in what country, uh, when we look at uh, every country, oftentimes women uh, walk a step behind men. That seems to be the custom. I'm sure many countries uh, uh, there is gender equality, such as in the US or in France. But in Japan, uh, typically uh, women, uh, women uh, were a step behind uh, their husbands and in the family that I grew up, when father came home, uh, even if we were uh, having a dinner, all of us uh, would uh, go to the uh, door, uh, entrance door, uh, welcome my father home. Uh, I was a student, uh, a junior uh, or senior high school student, uh, and I wondered why we had to do this. But come to think of it, uh, women gender and uh, men gender are equal. And um, uh, walking a step behind my husband, I do that. Uh, you laugh at me, but uh, it's um, misunderstood. I'm uh, walking three steps behind uh, my husband. I'm uh, walking um, three steps behind uh, my husband. Uh, thank you for uh, laughing at what I'm telling you. You know um, all about me. Women 
and men are equal, and、uh, we should all be aware of that. And when we look at Japan, well, in the、uh, more advanced countries in the world,、uh, such as、uh, US or France or UK,、um, the practice、uh, in the beginning、uh, may have been that、um, uh, there are more better equality, but、uh, women are doing all the house chore,、uh, cooking, uh, doing laundry,、uh, raising children. And、uh, the husbands are the breadwinners and、uh, providing food for the family. And、uh, that was the system that we have long seen in Japan. And the values of,、uh, assigned to women, well, gradually we are beginning to see more women in the、uh, national parliament and in science. There are more、uh, women scientists who are、uh, very active. And I'm happy to see them、uh, thrive. But、uh, we ourselves have to change. We should not blame others.、Uh, we should not,、uh, even including men. I used to、uh, blame men.、Uh, women are in such state because of men. But we ourselves have to change. We are not weak. Women are not weak. And、um, we have strength in our heart.、Uh, and We have lived.、Uh, you have come to today's forum and you are listening to the、uh, lectures. Why? There is a divinity in our heart, the divinity or sacredness in our heart. And that is the force、uh, for life、uh, that human beings are given. When a baby is born,、uh, there is divinity in that baby. And so,、uh, babies、uh, by nature, by instinct, And、uh, instinct, according to science,、uh, is such that、uh, babies are given、uh, sacred na nature, divinity, when they are born so they can survive. They are not taught, but they suckle on the mother's uh, breasts. Uh, and so that is an instinct. As for women's、uh, gender, the power of women and power of men. It is、uh, one uh, on one, and、uh, there's nothing that women are inferior about, but women are weaker. In Japan, at long last, we see、uh, parliamentarians who are women and scientists who are women. My niece、uh, is training to be an astronaut. And so, in traditionally male dominated world fields,、uh, women are more active. And、uh, women are equally exerting their power、um, these days in many fields, but be it men or women, to know oneself is most important, in my view. Without knowing oneself, if you simply listen uh, uh, and do as you are told by the husband, or because you do not know yourself, you, are, you do as you are told by others. But we know what we want to do. There is a life that we want to lead, there are things that we want to do. But But、uh, it is not possible for you to say that, and you cannot take a step yourself on your own. And that is a weakness, and that weakness confines you to a smaller space. In、um, men's world,、uh, they are employed and、uh, they have a greater freedom even after a child is born.、Uh, raising children is the、uh, responsibility of the women, so men still、uh, continue to have greater degree of freedom. But Inside us,、uh, be it men or women, we have a divinity inside us. And when a woman falls ill, if a wife falls ill, the husband、uh, will raise、uh, children. Uh, and so there is also、uh, women gender equality in men as well. So women, or not just the women, but people、uh, should understand who they are.、Uh, they should understand、uh, themselves. And when you're told you are such and such type of person,、uh, you cannot do this and that, and then you feel that you are not for good for anything. I mean, that's nonsense. You should believe in yourself more strongly. This is how I live. You are here, all of you. You work. You are working. I mean, that's your greatness, that's your great power. Because of your power, you can do all those things. So, this is what I wanted to say most to change yourself by changing yourself. What kind? No, who you are. 
what you have done. Is it right or is it wrong? You, you, you don't need to cult out your husband just because he earns his salary. Do I, do I have to think that? Well, madam, would you like to wrap it up? Yes. About women. <laughs> so, in principle, women have more female feminine intelligence. But if I could just say, without being afraid of me being misunderstood, there are many women who have more masculine intelligence than men do. I would like to move on to the next. So, sorry. So, looking at what's happening in the world, what's happening in this world, the Ukraine situation, situation Gaza, they are so serious. Every day, so many people are killed. I mean, this, this is heartbreaking. And there might be the usage of nuclear power, and the threat is increasing. Eight years ago, we experienced something. So what's the meaning? Since then, how humankind learned anything from what we experienced? I feel a sense of despair as I look at what's happening. So Mr. Onimaru, Onimaru-san, when you're looking at the current situation, disasters, conflicts, they, you have been supporting people who are suffering from those disasters and wars. What are the things we can do? What can we do? Thank you for your questions. Here in Japan about the situation in Palestine and Ukraine that's reported. And there are also disasters and conflicts in countries and areas that are not reported. I often feel heartbroken. So what can we do? Yes, to address the question I have received from the president, I think there's some, there are several ones. Yes, there is despair everywhere, but from the grief and despair, it's important not to avert our eyes from them. Those are facts, so grasp them as they are and be willing to know about them, that's important. But I tell myself that I shouldn't just stay there. So left-hand side, looking at the grief, right-hand side, it's important to look at what's there in the depth of the grief. Why do we see so much sorrow? Who is actually exploiting? that sorrow, what's to be generated from the grief and sorrow, and try to know, try to learn about those things, that's important. There's another important thing. It may sound bookish, but I have been, I think this is what I've been saying, and I would like, I have to say this, there is so much despair everywhere, but there is hope as much as there is despair. I mean, there are so many people who are voicing against what's happening in Palestine. That solidarity is found in a small country in Africa, Shibuya, Harajuku, young, young people are taking stand. That holds, that's true for the Wibo in Ukraine and also Uganda, Congo, in so those Congo and the Uganda. People are suffering from conflicts. They're trying to change themselves, trying to change their communities. I mean, there are numerous such movements in the world. So there is that hope, that there is hope. It's important that you try to learn that there is hope. The balance between the despair and hope, when you strike the balance, then for the first time, you will feel the courage. So don't be biased. When I say rightly, this is not really about justice, but see things as they are. This is what I learned from a Buddhist teacher. So look things as they are. So start from there. And then in your own place, in a given place, you think about what you can do in terms of actions. You think about it. You take actions. And then each one of us can perhaps choose to act. That's how I feel. Excellent. Dr. Tasaka, question to you. Humankind is in a real critical situation at the moment. On our part, we have been making 
low-profile activities step by step. But we are in a such a critical situation. So transformation of the awareness of the humankind as a whole, or changing the set of values in order to sort of nudge people, uh, encourage people to move this way, whether that's a new kind of science or whether that's an AI, a new technology, or kind of an epoch-making system, I don't know. But is there such a possibility that we might see the emergence of those things? I mean, you need to have a kind of an acing card. What's going to happen to humankind? Uh, to be honest with you, I do feel that kind of a sense of despair. Any comments? Let's see. Acing card. I wish. I wish we had an acing card. I don't know whether it's appropriate to say this or not, but regarding the problems we are faced with as humankind on a very deep level, it's pretty clear. You know this word. This awareness of humankind must be transformed. <laughs> You, we talked about Ukraine, and it's also true for Gaza. As we observe things, uh, political level, economic level, peace movement, there are many layers. But at the bottom, of the, in the very deep layer, as I see those news, this is how I look at it. I look at my own heart. I would like to raise this question to you. Of course, everybody supports peace. Everybody wants peace. But in ourselves, Dr. Elworthy, you have been talking about this. For instance, there's anger. You have anger in yourself. I mean, I shouldn't deceive myself. If I were Palestine and if my family had been killed, I would then can I really live my life without revenge, without retaliation? And the same holds for true for Israeli people. Your family members have been killed somewhere in your part. You might want revenge or retaliation. And of course, it's easy for us to just to, to say objectively that, uh, yes, it's bad to kill people. But in ourselves, there is violence in yourself, at least before I say, oh, that's horrible. But given the situation, I might take up arms myself. I might retaliate. I might make revenge. That kind of violence in your own self. I mean, without first looking at your violence, if you're just surrounded in this peaceful country, in a way, just to say, then it's not so difficult to just to say war is bad or, or you, you can do the donation. But for thousands of years, it hasn't really changed that you have this violence factor in your own selves. And there is this ego issue that I talked about. If it's short of violence, I mean, you are so affected by your own ego so easily. So without first grasping that, you can't really fundamentally solve this problem. I have used so much time, sir. Mr. Sayonji, to address your question, I'm 72 years old. I don't know whether I have 10 years left or not. Only God knows. But uh, there's one message I would like to convey to the humankind. I think this is my final life work. Let me explain. The fundamental paradigm of science, this needs to be changed. I am not saying something spooky. I'm an engineer scientist. I study the electro nuclear engineering. So from that perspective, going forward, the fundamental way of science needs to be changed. Otherwise, if 100 people just are killed, superficially, you feel, oh, sorry, but their awareness, their emotions, they are all different from your own feelings. Don't you feel that way? Don't you believe you are double standard life, including me, as Onimarusa said. And I think, Dr. Elworthy, you mentioned we are led by something great. That sense, you do feel that. I mean, synchronicity. I'm pretty sure that every one of you have felt synchronicity. Somehow, your intuition serves you right. That mysterious world is something we experience. But once we wear the scientific glasses, then we will say that it's not to justify it scientifically. So you end up th feeling that this is just a kind of illusion. And we live with these double standards. Or you visit your family's graves. 
But on the other hand, a scientist say because they are materialists, there is nothing once you die. This is science, and science is too materialistic today, and I think that should be fundamentally changed. I'm not uh, saying something dubious, uh, and uh, some of you may have um, read this, uh, but uh, the book I wrote is about uh, the death does not exist. At the leading edge of science, new vision is being uh, created. A few years ago, uh, Abin Laszlo received a Goy Peace Award, and uh, he says a Catholic field, and I'm a nuclear engineer, and uh, in my own way, I continue to do research of a Catholic field, and that is a, a very uh, tenable hypothesis, and uh, if uh, uh, Mr. Sayonji gives me more time, I would like to come back to this for more, but in a nutshell, in an easy-to-understand fashion, a Catholic field, field, do you think that this is a mere fantasy or fable? I don't think so. Uh, so uh, the leading edge science, uh, let's do a quick review. How, this, how did this world uh, come about? Not in a religious sense, but in a scientific uh, sense. The uh, science discussion is that the universe uh, was born 13.7 billion years ago. What happened 13.7 billion years ago? There was nothing. Uh, if uh, there was anything, uh, there was a quantum vacuum. And in quantum vacuum, this is a minuscule, a tiny, tiny, minuscule world. And all of a sudden, there was a fluctuation. And uh, this uh, world came about. Uh, that is an uh, inflation universe uh, theory, uh, according to many scientists, such as uh, Dr. Sato. And after uh, billions of years, we are now here. And another major theme in quantum physics is quantum entanglement. You might have heard of this. What this means is that uh, uh, two quantums, when they had uh, entanglement in the past, even if uh, they are located on the opposite ends of the universe, they are still connected in their behavior. And that is also a scientifically valid uh, discussion. So 13.8 uh, billion years ago, everything in this world came uh, from the uh, quantum vacuum. And if we believe in quantum entanglement scientifically, then it's very possible that we are connected in one way or another. And a Catholic field, uh, what lies at the foundation of that concept is that uh, there is a uh, quantum vacuum that exists uh, universally in this world. And uh, if everything is sucked out, uh, there's a vacuum, no air, nothing, uh, if uh, everything is sucked out. But in that vacuum, actually, there is a quantum vacuum. This is also scientifically uh, visible discussion. And uh, it's also proven that there is an infinite uh, amount of energy in that quantum vacuum. And uh, what I'm about to tell you is a hypothesis, but there is a zero point field in quantum vacuum. And everything in the universe is recorded in that uh, zero-point field. That is the hypothesis. And to be honest, when I first heard about this concept, I thought that this was uh, outrageous. But after uh, studying this so uh, much, I came to believe that this is quite uh, uh, plausible. The way everything in the universe is recorded is using a wave. A wave records everything. That, and as you know, in this world, everything is a wave. This is uh, also becoming a common sense in physics. It's not uh, anything that is dubious. For example, the glass here, this is solid glass, but it's a, a, a ripple or wave of um, elements, uh, including silica. But uh, repulsion between the uh, particles, if that's hard, it's going to be solid. Everything in this world is made up of wave, and that is all recorded in zero-point field. And I believe in this, so I am telling you. And in zero-point field, everything in the universe that ever happened is recorded. And that is not so uh, outrageous. The uh, grand uh, scale of the universe has uh, various events occurring everywhere, but it all came from quant uh, quantum vacuum. So thank you for listening uh, to my this um, uh, hypothesis. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So, uh, in one last, uh, one final point, I think that uh, if uh, further research is pursued in science, zero point field uh, hypothesis may be proven to be actually true. If I had 50 years or more alive, I would like to dedicate myself to that research. And if this hypothesis turns out to be true, then science and religion will not be at odds with each other. We sometimes experience, all of a sudden, the past experience uh, resuscitates. Uh, my friend, uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto, musician, died, and he said that he uh, was reincarnation. Uh, and uh, it seems that we have a memory of a previous life. And all these uh, mysterious, dubious things uh, turn out to be scientifically uh, grounded uh, if um, this hypothesis turns out to be true. And uh, everything is uh, one. And uh, I think uh, in the near future, this may, this can be proven. And uh, when it is proven, over many years, uh, materialists and uh, uh, religions uh, that were uh, at loggerheads with each other uh, will no longer be uh, conflicted. And when uh, that. Um, becomes true, then we will be finished with a prehistory. We are still in prehistoric uh, period. We are suffering from so much uh, hunger, uh, poverty, uh, uh, anger, conflicts, and we are still living in prehistoric age. But when there is a grand uh, fusion of religion and science, and when everyone feels that uh, at the depth of our heart, all of us are connected, and something that is mysterious is not as mysterious. And for example, my uh, late mother is uh, guiding me. That is how I feel. Why is that? Uh, why are these mysterious things happening? These are not mysterious at all. And if this becomes a new common sense in the world, then in the true sense, we are starting the official history. So still today, we are living in prehistoric age, prehistory, but uh, that shouldn't make us sad. With a conviction, we should continue to uh, move forward in the prehistory and open the new chapter of uh, history. And uh, when uh, that uh, history uh, age begins, we want to prove that uh, science and religion are not at conflict uh, with each other. And uh, that is what I'm uh, writing about in my book. And thank you very much, Mr. Sionji, for giving me the time to describe this. Thank you. And uh, as you uh, mentioned, if uh, these are proven, and if uh, science and religion are merged, I'm sure the consciousness of human being will change uh, fundamentally. A science without religion is imperfect, and religion without science is uh, blind, uh, as Einstein said. I want to offer one more comment. Kazuo Murakami uh, is a authority in, on genetic engineer, engineering, and he has served on the board of the foundation over many years. His wife is uh, here today. Thank you. And as uh, he conducted a research of uh, genetics, a person who weighs uh, 50 kilograms has has uh, 50 trillion cells. A uh, people who person who weighs 60 kilograms has 60 trillion cells. In each of these trillions of cells, there is an enormous amount of information. About 3,000 books of encyclopedia worth of information is contained by one cell. A human being has uh, 50 trillion such cells. And when I come to think of it, and what uh, was interesting is that according to the current uh, genetic engineering, we are able to read that information. What a tremendous advancement in technology. But uh, once uh, we, it means that we are able to read this information, it means that there is someone who wrote that information. Who is uh, more important? Who wrote that information? And it, uh, I don't know how to call that pers uh, being that wrote that information. Uh, that uh, researcher call, calls this something great. I do not know if it's uh, God or omni omnipotent presence, but a human being, a body of us is a small universe, and uh, there is an enormous amount of information embedded in our small universe. And that genetic, uh, genetic information is the basis of everything that we do, including walking, eating, and 
in the large universe, uh, such an accumulation of information uh, similar to what we have in cells uh, could exist in the universe. Uh, that is uh, my two pence um, after listening to uh, Dr. Tasaka. I'm uh, reminded uh, by our staff uh, to be uh, strict about uh, timekeeping. I have more questions, but at this juncture, I would like to invite each panelist to give a final uh, remarks to the audience and also people who are listening uh, in Japan, throughout Japan, and throughout the world. One final message. Sis, starting with you, Onimaru-san, Mr. Onimaru, thank you. With Dr. Edwadi, Dr. Tasaka, and Mr. and Mrs. Sayonji, the Japan and world wisdom that I respect so much. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I'm grateful. Just one comment. Today, I was able to understand deeply world and us are somewhat interconnected. Even if it's small, if we could just feel it together, I think this was really significant moving ahead. This peace forum has a lot of values, and I was able to feel that once again. Another thing, those people who are in the midst of sorrow, midst of struggle, there are so many people who are suffering suffering and sorrow, and I'm pretty sure there are many of you who have feel that, and still you want to change something, you have conscience, or you have that aspiration. We can have those things at the same time, and this is something that I want to check. So something that the humankind have done, we have to solve them. Humankind must solve them. I have, that's something that I have learned. Thank you. Dr. Tasaka, a message to everyone? Well, first of all, thank you so much for bearing with me, but I feel that I'm asked to say something at the zero point field. This, if I hope that you could uh, learn this, and then if you do, you will realize something. You are the world. The world is you. You are the world. The world is you. In other words, you are connected, if you are connected to zero point field, then we are the world. Our awareness, our consciousness is revealed. And then Buddhism actually already described this and about these different levels of consciousness. Please find that out. I'm running out of time, but the prayer in its true sense, this is something we should do. Many people give prayers, but sometimes it is just to exposure of ego, do this, but give me success. That kind of prayer is not really just a prayer. Please guide us. Please guide me. If you are thorough in that, then being connected to zero point field, that there is a high likelihood that you get connected to that. I'm still working on this. As I look back, 100 books that I authored, I felt that I was guided. Why on earth did I come up with this idea? It's not that I had some particular talent as I President said, uh, all the wisdom, high wisdom of the entire universe, we could be connected to that place as an orthodox scientific theory. I would like to prove this. I hope that somebody will prove this. And uh, infinite uh, possibilities, infinite potential that's dormant in you. That's not exaggeration. That's really true. So from the prehistory to the real history, so that children will start learning these things. Uh, and th through prayer, you become connected to the supreme wisdom. I think that's the ultimate purpose of the education. So with this, I just would like to wrap it up. Thank you. Well, Dr. Elwadi, to the audience or to the Japanese people in general. One last final message, please. Uh, my final message is very simple. Um, when there is something that you believe in and you go into your heart and you feel the world should hear it, just like our last two speakers and Madame and yourself, Take your courage in your heart 
and take a stand for what you believe. Stand up for what you see as a possible future. Just as our speakers have done, have the courage to say what needs to be said in the moment. It might be in your child's school, it might be in your college, it might be at your work, but stand up with your heart open and say what needs to be said. That's the first one. <laughs> and the second one is that the mantra of the last century was, what can I get? What can I earn? How much money can I make? And so on. <laughs> For humanity to survive, the mantra of this century, the 21st century, has to be, what can I give? What can I give? We, everyone in this room and further afield, we are now in service to the future. We have woken up to certain truths. We have heard great wisdom today. We are in service to the future. So ponder the question, what can I give? Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairperson, and I will have an opportunity to express our messages in closing. So to please join me in thanking all the great members of the panel with a round of applause. All the members of the panel, the moderators, thank you so much indeed. And the second part of this forum, this dialogue session, wasn't that impressive? I mean, some of you were in tears, some of you were in tears. For the first time in four years, we were able to have this in-person session, you participating in the hall. We could feel that energy exchange. I mean, this is a great atmosphere we have. And I felt on my skin that we are so lucky to be here. So please, once again, join me in thanking all the members of the panel speakers with a round of applause. Thank you so much. Well, last but not least, on behalf of the organizer, we would like to extend greetings to Dr. Maki Kawamura. Please come on to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us for such a long time. At the outset, as I said, going forward, the young people need to cre create peace. That's the era. Of course, we'll be supporting their endeavor. Because in the process of creating this network, uh, if it's overseas, go overseas, meet people, participating in meetings and forum, and spending t so much time. We have come so far, but now the uh, youth the younger people can create networks so fast, so rapidly. So I have such high expectations I, on the young people. I'd like to keep supporting them. I mean, there is going to be a generational change. And uh, Dr. Kawamura, I hope that you will be working harder and harder. I hope that uh, you will share with us your determination here. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you uh, very much for your kind attendance. And I would also like to thank the speakers. As I listened, I was in tears. Uh, there, it was uh, reverberating in uh, my soul. And uh, people with uh, aspirations, people who uh, keenly aspire to have a peace, uh, we had uh, much uh, to uh, take uh, with us uh, from the uh, discussion. And as the uh, president uh, said, uh, Goi Peace Foundation uh, is uh, acknowledging people with uh, wonderful uh, capabilities uh, to bring about uh, peace. And over 23 years, we have created a huge network of these people. And we also have uh, essay contest uh, and uh, ESD to create a children's network in essay contest. It is uh, not the end when essays are turned in. The children who participated in the contest continue to interact with each other. Every year behind the annual essay contest, the past participants in the contest help us in inputting a data or serving as facilitator for online forum. And uh, since three years ago, children, uh, a survey on uh, peace awareness is conducted. This is a survey of uh, contestants of the essay contest. And as a result, uh, if you visit our website, the survey results are published. There are two things I would like to uh, convey to you which are related to today's discussion. Will complete peace in the world possible in your lifetime? Half of the children said it's not possible, but 25% of the children said it is possible. Conflicts, wars are ceaseless and reported every day. However, despite that, 25% of the children are seeing future peace. And like Mr. Onimura, I felt hope. And I hope that these uh, aspirations of children will not be stopped. And so we would like to continue to support them. And another next question, what is necessary for you to build peace? And the answer, learning from the uh, forebears and uh, ability to raise voice or chance to raise voice. and. Uh, possibility to connect uh, with uh, like-minded other children. So this year, Hiroshima a Peace a Culture Village with an NPO, uh, we had a dialogue session with uh, Tanaka-san, who is an A-bomb survivor. And from 150 countries, more than 1,000 children uh, signed up showing their intent to participate. And they said uh, they wanted an opportunity like this, and they want to have more of these opportunities. In this way, Koi Peace Foundation is uh, building a network of people with wisdom, as you have seen today, and through uh, essay contest and uh, ESD, we also are creating children's network. Over 23 years, we have expanded these networks, and going forward, we would like to effectively connect these uh, networks so we are able to provide opportunities that children desire to have. And with that, we would like to uh, lead that to greater momentum towards the world peace. And please do continue to guide and support our foundation. Jack, Chairperson, Dr. Elworthy, all the way you have come to Japan and you have been just magnificent. Your husband is also here. He is such an excellent person. So I just would like to invite you to come up to the stage, both of you, the Dr. Elworthy and your husband, just to, I wanted to introduce you to the audience. I forgot the message, I forgot what I wanted to say. But truly, each and every one of you, your enthusiasm, 
Thanks to all of you, each and every one of you from the world over, we can invite such great people. And without your presence, this could not have happened. So I just would like to keep having your kind support. All of you, oh, instead of going to golf, I'm glad that I'm here. Instead of going out, doing sightseeing, if you feel that you are happy to be here, then that would be my pleasure. And as Dr. Kamura mentioned, we have built kind of a wisdom with wisdom and experience, wonderful people from the generation who won the Goi Peace Awards. And there are also young people, the youth network that we have built. We would like to have this kind of multi-layered framework. Actually, next year for Goi Peace Foundation, this next year will be the 25th anniversary. We need to pass it on to the next generation, so we would like to hold this next year. Again, I just would like to invite you, all of you, once again. We are thinking of having a bigger venue. So I sincerely hope that I'll be able to see all of you once again. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so grateful to all of you. Thank you very much. It was a very, uh, uh, the forum today was full of passion. With this, we would like to close the Goi Peace Foundation Forum 2023. Thank you very much.